Paul is over here in Ephesus, and he is um, writing to the church at Corinth. Apparently, he's received communication from the church. And right before he leaves Ephesus uh, to go to his next, next place, uh, he writes this letter because he's concerned about the state of the church at Ephesus. And, um, and so he, he lays out and, and answers questions, makes some statements, addresses some stuff in the church. We've already covered all that. About chapter 11, he, move, he moves into church, not discipline, but church order. And one of the first things he did was address the, the love feast or the partaking of the Lord's table and correcting that. And he moves out of chapter 11 and he gets into talking about spiritual gifts. And really chapters 12, 13, and 14 are a continuation of church order teaching. But he started talking about, you know, um, you know the, um, the gifts of the Spirit uh, and the motivation behind those gifts, uh, which is love. The 13th chapter is not, a, um, is not out of place. Hallelujah. You, did y'all know, y'all do know that, right? Hallelujah. Um, he, he writes to them, and in chapter 12, he talks about spiritual gifts. Chapter 14 talks about that. Chapter 13, just if you would almost sound like a chapter stuck in there out of place, but when you understand Paul addresses the motivation behind how they function and operate in spiritual gifts, then it makes sense. So chapter 13 is not out of place. It is an instruction and attitude and motive behind how you function in the church, and it is, the, it is love. Okay, it is not a complete discourse on the subject of love. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but it's not the complete discourse. It does cover a lot of things, and what he's, he begins in that chapter by saying, "If I have faith, and if I have you know uh, faith to move all mountains, and if I have you know the spiritual gifts and all this, and and, and doesn't have love, it's nothing." The synopsis is: without love, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, and so and, and understand the Corinthian church was a. Very carnal church. They were extremely carnal. Um, Paul would deal with that very early in this book or letter. And, um, and dealing with their right attitudes, as much as anything they do, their attitude was, was needed, needed correction and so forth. So he finishes the chapter 13th chapter, verse 13, now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, does not mean that faith and, and hope aren't necessary. Does it mean that they're irrelevant? It means that love operates in the higher position because it deals with our attitude and the heart behind how we do things. So uh, if you're ministering to people and you're not doing it out of a heart of love but for, pro for profit or gain, you, you don't really, you're not amounting to anything. Love has to be the motivating factor behind, behind everything we do. Therefore, it is the greatest because it is the motivation behind. Remember Paul said, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision over in Galatians, Fifth chapter, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Your faith has to have love as a motivation and a, and a foundational operating premise. So then he moves into chapter 14, follow after love. Now I'm reading King James and I'm just changing the word charity to love because it is what the Greek word is and uh, charity does not represent a full import of the meaning from the Greek word agape. Uh, really, this would be God's love, unconditional love, and not even unconditional love the way the world sees it. Unconditional love as God's position is on it, all right? It is the love that God is. And love, his love is, I love you, period. No ifs, ands, or buts, no requirements. Now, listen, no requirements for you to love him. He loves you regardless, Okay, but there are requirements to go to heaven. You got to get, you got to accept Jesus as Lord. You can, and God will love you and still people will be loved by God and will go to hell. Well, that's not love. Yes, love. Yes. Yes, it is. Because John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The love of God was man was in a place where he could not be redeemed, could not redeem himself, and his love for him sent Jesus to be our redeemer, our, our sacrifice, and the one we identify with, and if you will believe that, you'll be saved. His love sent Jesus, but it's still whosoever believeth. All right. Follow after love and... How many remember the old song from the, you know, uh, back in the 70s? I, well, some of y'all are probably not old enough, but I am, and, and Dick is, and Bill is. I think we're all three old enough. What the world needs now 
It's love, sweet love. And we kind of get off on this thing. The church does it. The church gets off on this. You know, all we need is, the, all we need is God's love. If we just love it. You know, no, 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 no. He says, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. There's other things the Bible says to do besides or in conjunction, or better stated, in conjunction with walking in love. We can't, we just, we limit things. We get to points where we just go, oh, well, you know, it's just, if we just, if we just love everybody, things are going to be hunkadory. Well, we know that's not true. God loves humanity. There's people who spit in his face today. I know someone uh, that, that, well, I actually led them to the Lord. Well, oh, but they, I, my witness to them, they came to our church and got saved. But it's because, because of the witnessing to them. They have filled the Holy Ghost, followed after God. They now say, I spit in the face of your God. Which is not a good thing. Just say it. Okay? That's not a good place to be, not a good thing to say. Love, God loves people, but people still have to believe it. People still have to, still have to do what God says. Somebody say amen. And Adam, he, he can go over next door now. I think some more kids are over there. Hallelujah. But rather that ye may prophesy. Now remember, this, remember Paul spent the uh, part of the um, 12th chapter talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Then he comes over here and, and, and talks about tongues and angels and, you know, not having love and so forth. And then he comes right back and says, now follow after love and desire spiritual gifts or spirituals. Remember, same thing in chapter 12, verse 1, things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. But rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto God, men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Now stop. Now you got people who just jump around and say, see, tongues aren't important. Let's read the whole thing. Let's take it in context. Let's not get out of hand. And let's not just jump in there and look for an opportunity to misconstrue or misapply Scripture. <clears throat> um, rather means that he, you know, rather that mean that he doesn't want you to do one the other. He wants you to excel in both, actually. Um, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, speak, or really the unword unknown is not there in the Greek. So it's who speaks in a tongue. And remember in the previous chapter, he says, though I speak with tongues of men or angels. Okay? It speaks not unto men, but unto God. Well, I think talking to God's good. What do y'all think? Talking to God's good. Everybody will agree talking to God's good. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit. He speaks mysteries. Now let me, let me say something here that will really help you understand this entire passage of Scripture. Remember, starting in chapter 11, right on through the end of chapter 14, Paul is addressing church conduct and how to, how to act and conduct yourself in the assembly. And so th you got to have the right parameters or the right background or the right setting as to why something was written to understand why and how it was written. Take it out of that setting and it will say something different. Okay? Now, if I can say, everybody come over to my house at the church tonight. Well, I'm talking to you people here. Then you go take that out there and play it at the mall and say everybody's invited to Pastor Ed's house tonight. Night. It's not true. It wasn't in the same setting. Well, you said everybody. Yeah, but I was in reference to the setting that it was in. So when Paul says here, follow after love, desire spirituals, but rather that ye may prophesy, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God, for no man understands to him, how be it in the spirit... He speaks mysteries. Now, here, the Bible says speaking in tongues is speaking in the Spirit. Then you got come, people come on. You can't do that. Oh, that's, not, that's not the devil. This is the devil. Just growling and gnarly and mean and ugly and nasty. God don't like ugly, by the way. Hallelujah. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men, what's for? To edification exhortation and comfort. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. What did, you, what did um, uh, Jude say? But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Build up means to edify. Okay? Here he says, he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, stop. Paul has already laid out his premise for what he's saying here. 
What's, it, what's his premise here? The edification of the church in the assembly. He's not saying tongues are not important. He's not saying that tongues shouldn't be in the church. He's not saying that tongues, are, you know, are necessary for only a certain season, you know, to get people saved, then it's all over with. He said that tongues will edify the person praying and that the person praying speaks mysteries with God. But in the church, now, you, if you go back and you study, um, and, and we'll, we'll get to it further in this chapter, Paul said, and there are translations that say it this way, Paul said, I thank, God I, speak in, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. And, and then one, even one translation, but the Greek bears it out, uh, more than you all or all of you put together. Now, the Corinthian church apparently had got a hold of thinking this, this speaking in tongues was, was, it was the cat's meow. That's what you just did, man. It was awesome. And they just did it. And I'll tell you, Paul spoke in tongues more than the church at Corinth. He went to bed speaking in tongues. He got up speaking in tongues. I think he prayed in tongues while he was sleeping. Prayed in tongues while he was walking, talking, eating, in between breaths. Because he said more than the whole church, all of them put together. He was a tongue-talking apostle. The apostle tongue-talker. <clears throat> all right? This is, I would. Now, would, the word would here means desire. I desire that you all speak with tongues, not rather, now, but rather, um, that word rather doesn't mean don't speak in tongues, I'd rather you prophesy. That's not, that's not the Greek meaning of that word, okay? It has more the sense of, uh, I want you all, I desire for you all to speak in tongues, yet I want you to excel at prophecy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with the tongues, except he interpret. Listen, here's the key that the church may receive edifying. Now, let me say this. If I came in here tonight and I said, good to have all of y'all, nice to have George with us. For the next hour. And said, glad y'all came. See y'all next week. Now, by the time that hour is up, I might be running and shouting and, and, and jumping the pews, acting out of my old Pentecostal roots. And you would have sat there and went, well, he got blessed. I didn't get a thing. Right? Unless I stopped halfway through and started interpreting what I said. So here's the deal. Paul's making it very, very clear in this passage that the instruction he is giving is in reference to how you conduct and operate in the gifts within the assembly. Not that prophecy, and you, we don't need tongues, we just need people to prophesy, you know, that speaking in tongues passed away. Well, then prophecy's passed away, and knowledge has passed away, all of it's passed away. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's, he's reiterating in his instruction. Remember, what, remember, the whole letter was written as a corrective and instructional letter to a young church that there were issues in. And so Paul is addressed, he addressed, he, he got, I mean, when you get down and start addressing how to receive the Lord's table and how you're to conduct yourself, this is a very micromanagement instructional letter. All right? He's excited that they love the gifts of the Spirit, but they are crazy with them. And so he's bringing correction, not to stop them, but to bring order to the flow. So that it's, it's a blessing. They wanted to speak in tongues all the time. Well, you can't do that. You're not going to help people, and you're not going to edify people if all you do is speak in tongues. You're going to get your socks blessed off. But, you know, <clears throat> our goal is not to get our socks blessed off and leave them defeated. We want to help people. All right. So Paul says that the one who speaks with tongues... The person who prophesies is greater than the one that speaks with tongues unless the one that speaks with tongues interprets. What? That the church might be edified. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I proffer you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? In other words, if I just come speaking in tongues and I don't bring a revelation that you can understand, if I don't bring uh, a knowledge or a prophecy or I don't bring doctrine that you can understand, I'm not profiting you. That's one thing if we're somewhere together and we're praying and we're all praying in tongues um, in, in, a, in, a, in a believer's meeting. And, uh, you, don't, you don't go to an evangelistic service and everybody just, you know, 
pray in tongues and act like, you know, woo, woo praise God, that's got the Pentecostal experience. In that way. Okay? It's not, it's not what we, you don't, you don't force that. And if you do, you're going to have to have ministry. See, some people get, they'll get over one side, they get in one ditch or they get in the other ditch. Oh, we're speaking in tongues. Let's just speak in tongues all the time. And, you know, and just, uh, you know, walk into a restaurant and speak in tongues to the waitress. Well, don't get mad when she brings you what you don't like. She'll bring you cow liver un undercooked. Well, I didn't know what you wanted. <laughs> Hallelujah. About as bad as silent prayer, isn't it? It doesn't do you any good to speak in tongues to somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about. But it'll do you good to go pray in tongues. It'll do you good to get in your prayer closet and spend time praying in the Spirit. It'll do us good corporately in a time that is for that purpose to pray in the Spirit. Hello? And I don't, you know, and, 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 and we'll, we'll get some more stuff here. Let's go here. And even things without life giving sound, whether a pipe or a harp, even they give a distinction in the sounds, how it shall be known what is piped or harped. For the trumpet give an uncertain sound, what shall, what shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Now, somebody just picks up a, a, a trumpet and starts, well, Nick's got a guitar up here. Somebody's never played a guitar, comes over and starts banging on it. You're, you're going to kind of go, first of all, Dick's not going to like it because he probably doesn't want you just banging on his guitar. Am I right, Dick? Yeah, okay. It's not going to sound right. And if, you know, if, if, if somebody's playing, all of a sudden they, they get off, they get off, you know. They look at something, they, they, you know, Nathan was listening to some music the other day, and, uh, and then finally they, you, you could tell. I heard it. I, I heard them singing it. You could tell that they were all looking for the key. It was, big, it was a big group, and they, were, you know, and, this, and they were playing one way, and then somebody didn't change the right key on the mute instrument or whatever, and everybody was kind of left out there, and then all of a sudden they all hit it and got it together, and they said, yeah, they finally found that key. <laughs> you know, and it, it, was an indistinct, it was an indistinct sound. If, if, if your charge is, you know, uh, the, whatever the, the trumpet players, you know, the little trumpet they blow with charge, they, if they blow reveille instead of charge, you're in trouble. If they start playing taps instead of charge, you know you're in trouble. They done given up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know? In the church, if all we did was speak in tongues and didn't either interpret or, have, or bring the word and bring and prophesy, people would not get edified, all right? So likewise, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh unto, to, shall be a barbarian unto me. You ever been somewhere, and, and, and where you were, they all spoke a different language? Well, I've traveled overseas, and I've traveled in, in, in numerous nations. And you walk into a room, and they're speaking Czech. Now, the, the joke about Czech is that when God's passing out languages, he didn't have anything left over, so he gave them Czech. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be some kind of just, you know, really whatever kind of language. And then I was preaching in the Bible school. It was, it was a Czech Bible school, but we had gypsies in there, and they had their own language. They had gypsy. So they, without the interpreter, they, you know, I was preaching. I mean, I preached. Stay on top of the desk, spit cotton four rows back. I mean, we were having us a time, but they couldn't understand anything until the interpreter told them what I was saying. And when they were talking back, you know, they were asking the interpreter questions. I was kind of like, hmm. What are y'all talking about? You know, we don't understand without, without that. So, I, you know, it didn't help me until I understood what they were saying, and it didn't help them until they understood what I was saying. Amen? Even so, ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts or of spirituals, seek, listen to what Paul's saying here, can you begin to get the thread? Verse 12, seek that ye uh, may excel to the edifying of the church. What did he say back up here in verse 5? Um, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. What did he say back up in, um, in um, verse 3? He that prophesied speaketh unto men to edify. All right, so we got 3, we got 5, we got 12. What do they keep saying? Edify the church. This is not don't speak in tongues. 
This is an instruction to a young church that does not know the proper order and flow of the Spirit. And Paul is bringing a correction and instruction in how to function the gifts within the church in a public assembly. Somebody say, yeah. <clears throat> and the key to the whole thing keeps coming back to the same thing, edify the church. Doesn't mean don't do it. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I don't know, really, what is it then is kind of an archaic way of saying, what, what am I going to do? Paul says, what am I going to do? He said, I will pray with the Spirit. Now, we know he just got through saying. Somebody says, that means fervent prayer. That's not what verse 14 said. He said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with my spirit. What does that mean? Praying in tongues. People say, that means praying in fervent prayer, not according to Paul. Come on. That's not what he said. Within this context, he said praying in the spirit was praying in tongues. So he said, I will pray with my spirit. How do you know he said that? Because verse 14 says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. I, what will I do then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. That's singing in tongues. And I will sing with the understanding also. Now, Paul, if you read this, you cannot come out of here if you're honest, unless you've got your church doctrine, been shoved down your throat, and you've been brainwashing to believe that tongues is not for the church. It's passed away the day the last apostle died, the day we got the canon of the scripture. Nothing in the Bible supports that at all. Total misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he says, when that which is perfect has come. That's the canon of the scripture. Really? You really believe that? You do. I got prime real estate waterfront property oceanfront property in Colorado I want to sell you all right now you got to be honest we have to be honest verse 16 else when thou shalt bless with the spirit how shall he that occupieth the room say amen at thy giving of thanks seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest now here we go goes back to verse 14 Praying with the Spirit, blessing with the Spirit, singing with the Spirit. It's praying, singing, blessing with tongues. Because it says here that the person standing in the room doesn't understand what you're saying. Are you here? For thou verily, listen, thou verily give us thanks. How? How? Well. So Paul's not knocking tongues. If you've been taught that Paul was knocking tongues here, he was not. How would an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ knock a manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God? And I just, I just warn you, do not attribute speaking in tongues to the devil. That is blasphemous. I said, that is blasphemous. For thou verily give thanks. Well, here we go back to this term again. Listen, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. And as I said earlier, the Greek bears it out. You'll find some other translations that also bear this. I believe Weymouth may say this. Um, I'm not positive this Weymouth. But um, um, other translations do say, I, I, know that I believe the Amplified says it. It says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, or all of you put together. Now, let me say this. Paul was a tongue talker. Yet in the church, here we go back to the theme that's recurrent throughout this chapter. Yet in the church. I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. What's Paul saying? My purpose in the church is to edify others, not to edify myself. 
My purpose when I minister in the church is not to edify myself, but to edify the people there. This is, this is the recurring theme throughout this chapter, is the edification of the church. And in order to edify the church, they have to know what you're saying. And in order for them to know what you're saying, you've got to speak in a language they understand, unless you're speaking in tongues and interpreting. Somebody say glory. Well, three of you did. How about the rest of you? All right. Amen. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Now here... Well, we could say that this, the church they couldn't. We don't be children in understanding. How be in malice be ye children? But in understanding, be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will, not, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, and I think um, if you go back to Isaiah, it also says, and this is the refreshing where you shall cause the weary to rest. With other tongues and stammering lips that I will speak to this people. It is a refreshing to who? The person praying in tongues. It doesn't refresh you for me to speak in tongues. It refreshes you for you to speak in tongues. It doesn't edify me for you to speak in tongues. It edifies you for you to speak in tongues. But if you were to speak to me the word of God and give counsel by the spirit of God or to prophesy unto me, that would refresh and edify me. Okay? So Paul, again, is dealing with the self-centeredness and the self-focus of the Corinthian church of it's all about me. Yeah, it's all about me. Come on. Everything's about me. Well, it's not. If you're going to grow, you've got to grow up and understand it's not about you. When we come together, it's not about you. It's about edifying the others. It's about being a supply. It's about, you know, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, we're not, we will get there eventually in this teaching, in this series. But Paul writes and talks about the body, how that every joint supplieth. So in the body, we are to be suppliers, not drainers. Now, if everybody's supplying and a drainer comes in, we can edify them and build them up until they, and, and get them on the track so they can become a supplier through discipleship and training and teaching and changing their attitudes through the renewing of their mind by the word of God so that they ultimately become a supplier and not a drainer. But if the whole body's draining and nobody's supplying, which is what's happening at the church of Corneth, you end up with stuff like the love feast. You got people over here starving, people over here drunk. Their attitude was wrong. They didn't care that a man was living with a stepmama. Right there in the open in the church. Paul did. Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. Woo! That was that love walk. That was love. Getting reproved and getting corrected and make it to, so you can make an adjustment and change instead of dying and going to hell is love. All right. <clears throat> well, here next comes a very difficult passage to get interpreted. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them to believe, but that them, them that believe not. Prophecy serveth not to them that believe not, but to them which believe. I therefore, if the whole come together in one place, and I speak in tongues, and there come in an unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say we are mad? But when you prophesy, there come in one that believeth not, or is unlearned. He that convinced all is judged of all, and the secrets of his heart are made manifest. He'll fall down on his face, and he will worship God and report that God, report that God is in you of a truth. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have, I have studied, I mean, you, you just can't get anybody to get, get real good on this. Now, J.B. Phillips just pulled a, just pulled a different, whole different way of doing it. He just went out there and flat out said, I think they made an error in the tra transcribe and changed it said, the tongues are a sign for the, for the believers and not for the unbelievers, and it fixed the whole thing. <laughs> He, now, he says it in a note. He's, he, he doesn't do this without, you know, and, I, and I, I don't know that I can accept that because nobody else does. But that was his fix. <laughs> Bless God, they made an error. The guy copied and made an error. So that's how we fix it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and I read that and go, well, you know, that, that sure helps me, but not really. Because there's nobody else that supports that position that Phillips took. Nowhere. And even though he acknowledged and said that he, he left the, you know, the writings, people, you, people who rebu re reprove that, rebu rebuke that, or rebuttal that, come along and say, you know, he has no manuscript. He has nothing to support that position. Okay? There's, no, there's nowhere in the church history we can support that. 
So, we're going to have to weed through this a little bit. I don't know that I have a full grasp on it myself. It says here, if you, you come together in one place. Now, one, one commentary is talking about this may have been a special day where everybody, you know, weren't meeting in the houses, weren't meeting in the small churches. They all got together in maybe an open public meeting. This was one, you know. And they're coming in them that are unlearned, you know, and, and I'm sorry, and all speak with them. So you all get together in this big, maybe even outdoor meeting, and um, say you all come together in one place and, and speak in tongues, and they'll say, you're mad. Yet it says back up a couple of verses that it was a sign to the unbeliever. Okay? Well, did they not mock them on the day of Pentecost when they stumbled out of the upper room? And then Paul, and Peter finally just said, they said, yeah, these guys are drunk. And they said, we're not drunk like you supposed. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. All right? Okay? If you all prophesy and they come to anyone that believeth not or is unlearned, he is convinced of all and he is judged of all. All right? So in other words, the preaching of the word. I think we're going to have to kind of come at this from this position <clears throat> that speaking in tongues is a sign. But if you got to, if you're having a meeting, if we, say if we're having an outdoor crusade, say the Ryan, even the Reinhardt Bonky meeting, and we bring all these unbelievers in, and everybody just stands up, and everybody just starts speaking in tongues, they're going to think we're crazy. Now, maybe if we're in a meeting and somebody gets something gets tongues, an interpretation of tongues, it's a sign that something supernatural is going on. But if everybody's just in there speaking in different tongues and, and that's all that's going on in that meeting, they're going to think we're a bunch of crazies. It's not that speaking in tongues is crazy, but there's a, it's, not even, it's, not, it's not out of place to speak in tongues in a meeting. He says if you come together, if all of you come together in one place and all of you are speaking in tongues and somebody walks in that's an unbeliever, they're going to think you're crazy. Can you imagine having the Reinhardt Bonky meeting? We all get down. Woo! We got all the charismatics in town. We're going to all pray. And I'm charismatic Pentecostal. So that's my roots. <clears throat> all 20,000 of us are going to speak in tongues at one time for, tw for two days. You're not going to accomplish a whole lot. Amen. Now, somebody could walk into this church service. This is not all of us gathered in one place. We're not all speaking in tongues. We're not all, you know, just up here all trying to outdo each other with tongues. It's not tongues wars. Okay? But maybe I'm going along, my, and, I, and I've had this happen. You know, uh, preaching, stop and have tongues and interpretation of tongues, and, and unbelievers don't get freaked out because there was an order to what took place. It was the Holy Ghost. It was a sign that something was going on supernaturally. Now, there's been cases where uh, we've, we've, we've heard of cases and testimonies where, uh, you know, this man walks into a church service. He sits down. One person gets up and uh, says something in tongues. Somebody else gets up and says something in tongues. Nobody interprets. And that man comes down and gets saved at the end of the service. Because the one guy got up. The guy was a scholar in Greek and Hebrew. And one guy got up and spoke a word to him directly in, in Hebrew. The other guy got up and said something to him and said, uh, finished what was being said to him in Greek. He knew it was a supernatural sign. That was a supernatural sign. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I heard uh, uh, one well, well, well-known evangelist that you would probably consider non-charismatic. Uh, he was ministering somewhere. And in, right when he got to the end of his sermon, somebody just got up and started speaking in tongues, real loud over the whole congregation. And then they just ended the service because, you know, the people running got freaked out. Somebody spoke in tongues in their service. And they went back and asked this well-known evangelist in the back room after. said, what do you think about that? He said, he finished my last point. He understood the language he was speaking in. He, sp he finished my last point. It was a sign to him. Okay? Because, you know, he may not have believed in the tongues. Again, take this in the context of what Paul's doing. He's bringing correction to the church. Instruction to how to manifest things. All right? If, we're, if, we, if we go out here and have an outdoor crusade at the park to reach the lost, and all of us just out there speaking in tongues real loud, and then the, then the, then the lost guys start showing up to, you know, to hear the message or whatever we're supposed to be doing, they're going to think we're crazy. What are these? They're all, there's about 50, 50, 50 different languages going on over there. It's, it's a, let's make sure we have the right order. It's really that's, I think if, in context of that, it makes more sense. I can't really accept Phillips' premise, although I love it. It made it so, weird. Bill's shaking his head. I mean, it's like, hey, that fixed it, man. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, Bill's giving it the thumbs down. But understand, in Romans Day, that meant what we say about thumbs up today. That's for Bill. 
I am not purporting Phillips is an accurate position. But it sure would make life easier. Anyway, <laughs> I just, you know, again, <clears throat> uh, you may read that and go, whoo, that's it. I really can't. I like a lot of things he says, but you just can't, you can't, you can't go there. I like particularly Galatians, I believe, the third chapter in the first verse. Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. I just love that. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and thus, verse 25, the secrets of his heart of man manifest after prophesying. He's judged by the words that are spoken. He falls on his face. He worships God, reports that God is in you and of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Here we go again. The recurring theme, let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three at the most, of two or three, and that by course, by the most, I'm sorry. Let it be by two or by the most, by three, and that by course, let one interpret. That does not mean you have set tongue talkers and interpreters every service. That's saying in, in, in a particular service, if somebody's going, let me say this again. I believe the, 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 the weight of what Paul is saying is addressing the congregation. It doesn't mean if you're, if you're just worshiping God and then you start, start speaking to, oh, I can't do that because, okay. I believe what he's saying here is in addressing the congregation because if, you know, if I'm back here just praising God and say, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I am not addressing the congregation and I'm probably not edifying the congregation. I'm not prophesying in such sense. There are tongues that are tongues of ministry. There are tongues that are tongues of prayer. Okay? There are tongues that address the church. And the tongues that address the church are tongues with interpretation of tongues, which is equivalent to prophecy, which edifies the church. Okay? So if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or by at the most three. Now remember, the Corinthian church was having the issues. The history, historical we understand, they all like to speak in tongues. They thought, that, they thought that was the highest gift because it was the coolest gift. It was the easiest for anybody to participate in. They couldn't even judge if you were accurate in what you were saying because they didn't know what you were saying. They couldn't have you go, uh, <laughs> some of y'all were here, maybe you were here. Years ago, I got to preaching. And I got to preaching about how the Roman army followed the children of Israel to the Red Sea and how that God split that Red Sea and the Roman army was the most powerful army of that time. And they were trained and they were awesome. And, they were, and so I was just preaching about how the Roman army had been, how they knew how to fight and how that when their children of Israel went over on dry ground, the Roman army came in behind them and God drowned the entire Roman army in the water. Glory to God. And I stood up here for a minute. Somebody in the church looked up and said, Pastor, Pastor, it was the Egyptians. <laughs> well, the Roman army was pretty cold too, but anyway, <laughs> that happens. You just kind of, it's like the woman got up one time and say, um, um, as I was with uh, Noah in the wilderness, and as I was Noah at the Red Sea, I'll be with you. She sat down, sat for a minute, everybody's kind of going. She stood back up and said, yay, the Lord hath made a mistake. It was Moses. <laughs> well, how can that be? Listen, you can be inspired and you, you're a human vessel, you're, you're, you're an imperfect vessel, you can make a mistake. Even under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you can make a mistake because you're yielded. And, but, the, you know, we're human. That's why we always judge everything by the written word. And not, not by a gift, because imperfect vessels are being used. Amen. You know, you got, you got, you got pseudo-Christian cults out there today that say their living prophets supersede the dead prophets. Well, I don't think so. Y'all hear y'all going home. Okay. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. In other words... Okay, this is not, let's line up so who can get in here and get in on this deal and, and show everybody in the church. I remember uh, somebody that was in a church that I was in at one time. About every service we came, this person wanted to prophesy. Quote, prophesy. Now, I don't know, really know if it was prophecy, because about every time they opened their mouth, I felt like somebody was over top of me with the Gatorade bucket. 
and, you know, got me after the game because it was like pouring cold water. You may just come out of an awesome time of worship, and here they come. And you're like, finally the pastor had to tell them, I don't think you're in the spirit all the time. I don't think you're in the spirit most of the time. You want, you know, you, to be wanted to be used by God and it be God are not necessarily the same thing. Okay? And um, here he says, he's trying to bring order. He's trying to bring order. If these guys are giving tongues, if somebody's giving interpretation, you don't have to get in on it. All right? Again, corrective or instructional. More, more instructionally corrective. Not, not a full-blown rebuke or reproof. It is an instructional correction. Here's how it works. You may, God's used you. You know, you know that's the Holy Ghost. You're praying out in tongues. You're speaking out in tongues. But when we're in the church, it needs to operate within these parameters so that people are edified. Okay? Not so you can go out to them, man, I prophesied tonight. Or I had a tongue tonight. Woo! It's not about you in the first place. And that is immaturity. Verse 31, for you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. Now that does not, and this is the very next verse, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That does not mean if you may all prophesy by one by one that we all line you up and everybody in the room prophesy over everybody. I used to go to the cottage prayer meeting where we all had the prayer chair. And we'd sit in the prayer chair, and everybody in the room would lay hands on you, and they would have a word for you. And it was always a good word. You're going to travel the seas. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And it was the same one for everybody. Just start copying everybody. Everybody prophesied over everybody. Well, Paul just got through saying, you know, not, not to have everything going on at one time. He says, you may all prophesy one by one, may learn to all be comforted, and the spirits of the prophets are subjects to the prophets. He said, you can't say, I just couldn't help myself, I had to say it. That, your spirit is subject to you. You can stop that. Now, let me give you an example. Verse, next verse. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now, God is, you, know, you don't have a special church. You don't get to get away with being crazy. You don't get to get away with being out of order. God's a God of order. He's not an author of peace. I mean, he's an author of peace, not an author of confusion. A number of years ago, and it's been over 10, I'd say more like 15, we were, we were at one of the winter Bible seminars in Tulsa, and... Um, of course, the dad was still alive. And brother, back, back in that time, we'd had so many people coming. We'd, um, they, they put a 1,000 so on the, in the choir loft. Choir loft was, had, had sitting, it sat about 1,000. The floor sat about 6,600, and they put another 1,000 chairs out. So you'd have about 8,000, 8,500 people in the sanctuary. Then they have them over in classroom buildings and other places with, with closed circuit TV and showing the service over in the over, what we call the overflow rooms. So you had to get there four or five hours early to get a seat in the sanctuary. And, you know, well, Brother Copeland and those guys would come in, and they would let them come in late and, and then give them special seating on the platform up in the choir loft. And so I would stood in line that afternoon for about six hours. Got a seat. If you're looking at the platform on the first catacorner section, about the four rows back on the end. Boy, I got me a good seat. And I'm sitting there that night, and boy, I'm telling you right now. Brother, Brother Hagin, he's talking, walking around, talking, walking around. I look at Brother Copeland, and the word of the Lord came unto me. I had a word for Copeland. Yeah, right. No, I had a word for Copeland. I flowed in the gifts of the Spirit long enough, I knew it was the Holy Ghost. It was all over me. It was going all over me. Hallelujah. I recognize the whole, I grew up Pentecostal. I've been in the charisma. I know, I know the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
Dear God, what am I going to do with this? That's a word for Brother Copeland. And if I even take one step to that platform, 65 ushers are going to take me out. I'll be buried out somewhere on the backside of the building. They won't, even, they won't ever find me until they get ready to build some other new building out there 20 years later. You know? <clears throat> All things going through my mind. I'm just sitting there, and I, and I just sit on it. Well, if, if that's God, you had to give it. No, 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 no. Hold on. About five minutes later, Dad turns around. Dad Hagen turns around, looks at Brother Cup and says, Kenneth, come here. And he begins to prophesy to him. Now, you understand, spiritual things are about the essence, not, not actual word-for-word -word verbiage. But what Brother Hagen said to Brother Copeland was exactly what was in me when the word of the Lord came unto me saying. It's exactly. And I began, I got back, I began to pray about the Lord. Now, what was that all about? And see, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I can't say, oh, I had to give it. I just had to give it. I just, I, I couldn't help myself. The spirit made me, and Paul Geraldine, but we, we, the spirit made me do it, baby. You remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. The spirit, but, no, he said, I'm teaching you. I just wanted to teach you and confirm to you my voice. Now, number one, probably when I had an opportunity to even get to the platform to give it, in a big meeting like that, you understand, smaller meetings, things can be handled differently. But in a big meeting, you just, you just, it's just you can't, you can't handle things the same. Amen. Secondly, Brother Copeland would receive it easier. I didn't say he wouldn't, wouldn't have received it from me, but it would have been easier for him to receive it from Dad, whom he considered a spiritual mentor. It would just been easier. Well, he's a respect. Well, it just, it just, we're people. Hello? I, I had it, but I didn't give it because that, my spirit is subject to me. And I learned a lesson in that that night. God don't make, he's, he's a, he's a, he didn't make you do anything. And if he did, he'd, get, he'd make everybody get saved. We'd all be in heaven right now. Hello? Okay. Now, this is the end of this particular passage. We're going, we're, I, I hate to jump in this tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and do it real quick. Let the women keep silent in the churches. If you study other translations, married women, the wives. For it's not permitted to them to speak, for they are commanded to be under obedience, as, the law, as also saith the law. <clears throat> and if they will learn anything, let the master husbands at home. You cannot be a, uh, just a woman if you have a husband. You're a wife. Okay? For it is a shame for the women to speak in church. Now, uh, there's, some, there's some things that people have done some study, and they've come up with this, that in, the, in that era, the women would sit separate from the men, and they would actually just ask out loud. They'd pull a Jeff right there in church. What's he talking? What's he saying? What's he talking about? Paul says that's a shame for the women to do that in the church. They shame their husband. They shame themselves. If you got a question, just ask your husband at home. Okay? What came the word of God out of you or, from, or came only to, only to you? If a man thinks himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that these things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, see, you got some people who say there's only one commandment. Paul said all the stuff I've written to you is the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. <laughs> what a... Where's that love thing everybody talks about? If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's what Paul said. Let me say it this way. If you're going to be hard-headed, just be hard-headed. If you're going to be hard-headed, just be hard-headed. If you're not going to listen, tough. Or the Ed Taylor version, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. All right? Wherefore, brethren, oh, all you Bible schools that say if you speak in tongues, don't come to our school. All you churches that say if you speak in tongues, don't come to our church. All you people who rebuke and, and, and declare that you're, you're so spiritual because you demand that nobody's speaking. You got to sign a contract that while you're at their school, you, you won't speak in tongues. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy 
and forbid not to speak with tongues. Do what? Forbid not. You find me a scripture that says you can, and I'll let you do it. I just got one that says you can't forbid it. So if you're forbidding it, you're in direct violation of the written word of the living God. And I ask you, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to violate the written word just because your bunch says you don't believe in it? That went over big. Well, I got big amens out of that one. Last verse. Again, <coughs> Paul, kind of wrapping, <coughs> Paul kind of wrapping up this section. Let all things be done decently and in order. That recurring theme over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout this, this passage and this section of Scripture is the edification of the church. 